Well, last week, we announced the official start, as far as Gospel Open Bible Church is concerned, the official start to the Christmas season. So let me ask, show of hands, please, how many of you went home after the sermon last week and put up your Christmas tree? Oh, you're kidding me. Do I have to preach that same sermon last week that I start over? How many of you at least watched a, a, like a Hallmark Christmas movie or something last week? Okay, we got a few of those. All right, all right. We're, uh, how about uh, uh, listening to some Christmas carols on the radio? Yeah, we got a few of those. Okay, we're, we're getting the wheels rolling. We're, we're getting the engine moving a little bit. Okay. Well, praise God. It is the Christmas season. And uh, even if you didn't participate in putting up your tree and decorating, I mean, we've had our stuff decorated for like a month now. I mean, I don't know what you guys are waiting for, but... Um, but that's okay if you didn't participate in any of that, because all of that, honestly, is secondary in my book. Instead, the most important thing for us is that we prepare our hearts to celebrate with joy arguably the most amazing event this world has ever witnessed, the birth of Jesus Christ. As I said last week, and I'll say again this week, the Christmas season is not necessarily about the tree, about the decorations, about the lights, about the presents, about the movies, about the candy, the cookies, all those sorts of things. But it is about the age-old promise of God being fulfilled in His Son, Jesus Christ. It is about the birth of the One who came to save us from our sins. It is about Emmanuel, as we just sung about it, God with us, who has established the new covenant in his blood. It is about the life of Christ, in whom the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead have life again. In a nutshell, Christmas is not about trees, decorations, lights, presents, all those sorts of things but it is about Christ. Amen? And as exciting as the celebration of Christ's birth is, how many of you know it is so easy in this dark day and age to have our joy stolen by any number of difficulties? There is tragedy and trial that threaten to diminish its excitement, there is materialism that tries to devalue its, its worth. There is unsettled family disputes that attempt to plunder its peace. There are depression and loneliness and all kinds of other things that attempt to distort its beauty. But it is my earnest prayer that this world and the devil and our flesh won't steal the wonder and the excitement and the glory of Christ's birth from us. It is my heartfelt prayer. In fact, I am praying very specifically for you during this Christmas season that God would produce four specific things in your life and my life as well because I, I need help too sometimes. But those four things are an awakening to the wonder of God, a solidifying faith in Christ, an inspiration toward gratitude, and lives that pursue the glory of God above all other things. I am praying that earnestly for each and every one of you in this place. And so while this is entirely a work of the Holy Spirit, it is also my understanding that one of the main tools that God uses to bring about this work is the Word of God. Therefore, we are walking through a series of sermons centered around some of the great blessings we have received because of Christ coming into this world. Last week, we began with the gift of the supernatural miracle of peace in the storm. If you missed it, it's online. You can listen to that on our website. But we as Christians are to be the most peace-filled people on the planet. Amen? But unfortunately, peace can be strangely absent from our lives, usually because of a distracted faith or a misplaced faith. We put our faith in the wrong thing and not in Christ, or we're distracted from where we should be placing our faith. And because of that, peace 
is stolen from us. But when faith is placed properly in Christ, he brings a peace that surpasses all understanding, no matter how stormy the circumstances of life get. And this is a miracle which we would not have if Christ hadn't come. So that was last week. This week, we turn to the book of Acts in order to unveil another gift that we have been given through the coming of Christ. Specifically, the gift of a name. There is a sermon outline in your bulletin that you can follow along. But before we get there, would you pray with me? Father, your word says that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we will say to that mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and nothing will be impossible for us. Father, I declare today that I believe. I believe what your word says. I believe that Jesus is the Christ And so therefore today I pray, I ask you, Father, that you would move mountains in this place by your Spirit, according to your word, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Bible text for the day is brief, and it comes to us from the last half of Acts 11:26 which says this And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch To help us understand the significance of this short phrase it is important that we turn to the history and the context of the book of Acts So with that we start this morning with just a brief overview of its timeline At the end of the Gospel of Luke, we see that the resurrected Jesus, we see him ascending to the Father as the disciples watched him go. But then we find at the beginning of Acts, uh, Luke, who also wrote the book of Acts, backtracks slightly to the time just before Jesus ascended and provides us with a more detailed picture of what happened and what was said right before Christ ascended. And what we find is that Acts begins with Jesus giving the disciples some very specific instructions. In fact, he tells them this in Acts 1.5. He says, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And with that, they are instructed to remain in Jerusalem until this promise has been fulfilled. So then Jesus departs, he ascends up into the clouds, he disappears from their sight, and we're told that in the same way that he left, the same way he will return. And from there, the disciples follow Jesus' instructions by returning to Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit and all of his fullness. Then we find on the day of Pentecost, as these disciples were gathered together, They were praying, they were waiting. We find that the fulfillment of the promise came. Acts 2, verses 1 through 5 says this, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. The miraculous happens, the fulfillment of the promise from the Father happens, and as a result, there was some confusion and even criticism surrounding what had happened from those outside of the upper room. Some were completely astounded because they were able to hear the praises of God in their native language. 
others mocked and ridiculed, saying the disciples must have had too much wine this morning and they were just merely drunk. But Peter full of the Holy Spirit, took his stand with the others and began to preach and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result, Scripture says that around 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom that day in one sermon. Isn't that amazing? And all of this is incredibly significant because it is this day and its events that mark the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. But its mark on history didn't end on the day of Pentecost. Through signs and wonders, through manifestations of the Holy Spirit, through the proclamation of the Word, through unity in Christ, there was a a continued growth in the church. In fact, you could say it was explosive growth. It grew very rapidly from that time. In fact, God worked through Peter's second sermon to add an additional 5,000 souls to the kingdom. Two sermons, 8,000 souls. That's pretty productive. Quite amazing. Interestingly, though, running parallel alongside this explosive growth of the church was the threat of persecution. As the church grew and multiplied, so too did opposition. For example, in chapter 4, we find Peter and John were imprisoned after healing a crippled man in the name of Jesus. They did a good work, but it was in the name of Jesus that caught the attention of the religious authorities, and they said, you can't be doing that. Or we find in chapter 5, The apostles altogether were arrested, they were beaten, they were threatened with further punishment, and then released with the command to stop preaching in the name of this Jesus. Or we find in chapter 7, we read about the first martyr as Stephen was taken outside the city walls by the Sanhedrin council, the same council that had condemned Jesus. And they threw stones at him until he died because they said he was blaspheming, calling this Jesus God. So Luke shows us in Acts that as the church grew greatly, grew very rapidly, in a parallel way, so too did the threat of persecution. In fact, after the death of Stephen, Acts says a great persecution broke out against the church. And it was led by a young Pharisee named Saul, or better known to us by his Greek name, Paul. And it says this in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him, Stephen, to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. As a result of this great persecution, it says here that the church in Jerusalem was scattered abroad. And now let me just pause for a moment. Let me just make a side note observation from all of that so far, right? It is so easy in our lives to get discouraged and distracted by difficult circumstances, isn't it? Can anybody else witness to that? It is so easy to get discouraged when we go through the valley. But just because the church was facing difficult obstacles including prison and death, it doesn't mean that God wasn't up to something very, very good. And sometimes we have this great ability to allow our faith to be distracted by the difficulty, and we find ourselves focusing on all of the negativity. But if we do too much of that, we run the risk of missing the miracle that God may be doing right here in our midst. In Acts, the church was growing. 
the word was being preached with great boldness. Lives were being radically transformed. Sins were being forgiven in Christ. People were being healed of all kinds of sickness and disease. Yes, there was opposition and difficulty, but the greater reality was that God was doing a great work. And therefore, they were, as Paul says in Corinthians, they were afflicted, but they were not crushed. They were perplexed, but they were not despairing. They were struck down, but they were not destroyed. They were persecuted, but they were not abandoned. And may the same be said about us. Though we may face opposition and difficult circumstances, may our eyes of faith be fixed on Christ, who is the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. May our eyes be fixed on Christ, no matter how difficult the circumstances get. Amen? That's what I see in Acts so far. Okay, so this timeline of events leads us to Acts 11, which is where we get our verse of the day. And I want to start in verse 19, just to give us some context of, of what this verse is, is leading to or leading from. So in verse 19 of Acts 11, it says this, So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, or the Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. As the church is scattered because of this great persecution that broke out in Jerusalem after Stephen's death, we find the disciples settling in different places around the region, three of them specifically, along the coast of Phoenicia, on the island of Cyprus, and in the northern town of Antioch. And it says that as they went, being driven by this persecution, they were speaking the word of God. As they went, they were evangelizing. As they went, they were declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. But notice here the primary focus of their evangelism. It was to Jews alone that they spoke to. Up to this point, for the most part, the church was predominantly Jewish. Jewish promises had been fulfilled by a Jewish Messiah in the Jewish city of Jerusalem and adopted by Jewish people. But notice also here a radical turn of events. It says some of them who came to Antioch began speaking to the Greeks also, the Gentiles, the non-Jews. They were preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. This was radical. This was scandalous, right? This was unheard of. But at the same time, it was also blessed by the Lord, as it says in verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed and turned to the Lord. Large numbers of Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ. And as a result of this, the news of this amazing turn of events reached Jerusalem where the apostles still were. They hadn't been driven out of Jerusalem at this point. And they catch news that something, something odd is happening up in Antioch. 
And so to validate the report, they decided to send off Barnabas, who is, who is described for us uh, in Acts as the son of encouragement. And they sent him up to Antioch to inspect, see if this is really true, see what is really going on with these people. And it says that what he found when he arrived, that it's described as the grace of God being poured out on both Jew and Gentile. And how did he respond? With jealousy? With arrogance? With anger? Nope. Instead, he responded with rejoicing. The gospel has come to the Gentiles. Just as was predicted by the prophets, just as was predicted by Christ himself, and it says that he encouraged them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Why? Because he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. I read about Barnabas and I think, boy, he was an incredible man of God. I can't wait to meet him someday. In Antioch, what Barnabas found was that by God's grace, considerable numbers were being brought to the Lord. So much so that he decided to go off to Tarsus to find Paul, who is now a follower of Christ. And after finding Paul, they go back to Antioch, set up camp, and met with the church there for an entire year, teaching and instructing and encouraging them in Christ. What an amazing time that must have been. But the point of this testimony about Antioch here in chapter 11 is that this was an amazing community of disciples. I mean, think about this. You have those who have fled from the great persecution in Jerusalem, but remained faithful to the gospel message and proclaimed Christ among them. You have considerable numbers of both Jews and Gentiles worshiping and serving Christ together. You have Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and the untimely born apostle Paul teaching and instructing the church for a year. And all of this in a pagan land, under a pagan government, with a strong pagan influence. These were amazing people. And it was in this context that Luke says in verse 26, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, at this point, we may be tempted to dismiss the importance of what happened in Antioch by saying, well, it's just a name. What's the big deal? Right? It's just, just a name, Christian. That may be the temptation. And while in many regards, a name is just simply that, a name, but in other regards, it is incredibly significant right? For instance, we see this in our own names, right? Most of us have three parts to our names, a first name, a middle name, and a last name, right? And those three parts carry different, different uh, levels of importance, right? So my middle name is Jeremy and really doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody other than my mother who picked it and probably doesn't make any difference to most of you. Most of you probably didn't even know that was my middle name. It makes no difference to you uh, as far as my identity, whether my middle name's Jeremy or whether it's Sam, right? But on the other hand, our first and our last names are incredibly important in identifying who we are. My last name, for example, is Cummings, which identifies me with a certain family, a certain group, uh, with a common heritage, right? And my first name, Chad, identifies me further as a specific individual within the Cummings family tree, right? So my first name, my last name are incredibly important to identify who I am. Not so much my middle name, but my first and my last name, I think you get the point, are important just as yours are. So at one level, maybe a name doesn't have much significance, but on another, a name is critically important because it provides us with an identity and a legacy. Such is the case with the name Christian, which, by the way, means one who associates with Christ. We often see in the Old Testament that names were incredibly important and carried a lot of meaning. 
In fact, it wasn't uncommon for a person's name to be changed when they came into contact with God and his purpose for their life. We see this with Abram, who after the covenant had his name changed to Abraham. We see this with his wife Sarai, whose name was changed to Sarah. We see this in their descendant Jacob, who becomes Israel. And in a similar way, we see in in the book of Isaiah that as, as Isaiah points forward to the new covenant in chapter 62, we see that a significant part of the new covenant that he points out is that God's people would be given a new name. It says this, Isaiah 62, 2 through 4. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. And you will also be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem or a crown in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you of you forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said desolate. But you will be called my delight is in her and your land will be called married. For the Lord delights in you and to him your land will be married. Isaiah says, no longer will the world call God's people forsaken. Your name will no longer be forsaken. No longer will the world refer to your land as desolate. But under the new covenant, the Lord will provide his people with a new name and a new identity. Isaiah says this new name will identify God's people as my delight is in you. To which I would argue from from Acts 11.26 and the rest of the New Testament, that it finds its fuller expression in the name Christian, the one who associates with Christ. Through Christ, we are made righteous, just as Isaiah is pointing to here. Through Christ, we become objects of delight instead of vessels of Wrath Through Christ, we are given a crown of beauty instead of ashes. This theme of God's people being given a new name also carries over into the New Testament. For example, through the words of Jesus in the book of Revelation, Revelation 3.12, Jesus says this, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God. And my new name. Jesus says here that the one who overcomes. Which Revelation tells us later is the one who who claims the blood of the Lamb. And the testimony that Jesus is Lord, even when faced with death, that they will have the name of God, the name of the city of God, and the name of Christ written on them. This new covenant comes with a new identity and a new name, which I am arguing is the name Christian. This is important because the concept of a new name harmonizes with the idea of transformation. In Christ, we are changed. We are transformed in every area of our lives. For example, our minds become transformed and renewed in Christ. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect or again our nature is changed as the old creature passes away in order to make room for the new second corinthians 5 17 therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creature the old things passed away and behold new things have come i love that verse Or again, our physical state at the resurrection will be changed and transformed and made new, all in the twinkling of an eye. 
1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, referring to death, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed, transformed, glorified in the sun. Amen? Therefore, it stands to reason, as our spiritual lives are transformed in Christ, so too will be the name which serves to identify us. In fact, we could say it from a different angle, from, from logic maybe, that a transformed life deserves a transformed name. Think about it. If water is frozen and turns to ice, we don't keep calling it water, but we call it ice. If a river is dammed up and a lake is formed, we don't keep calling it a river, but a lake. Or if a caterpillar goes through metamorphosis and becomes a butterfly, we don't keep calling it a caterpillar. It is now a butterfly. In the same way, in spiritual matters, through Christ, we are talking about radical, life-changing, born-again transformation right down to the very core of who we are. I was once a blind man, but now I see. Therefore, it makes no sense to keep calling me a blind man. Throw away the cane, get rid of the handicap sticker because I am not blind any longer. I have been transformed in Christ and my new name is Christian, one who associates with Christ. With that, though, this new name carries with it much more than just identity, although identity is key to everything else. But as a born-again disciple of Christ, having the name of Christian brings with it a wealth of treasure, a wealth of blessing. And specifically, I just want to point at three for us to chew on, just for sake of time. And So three implications of the name Christian. First of all, Christian connects us to God, maybe the most important aspect of the name. Jesus prayed this to the Father the night before he was arrested and crucified in John chapter 17, beginning in verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. And then a few verses later, verse 25 and 26, he goes on to say this. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. We find here that through the ministry of Christ, the name of God has been made known to the world. Specifically, he has made that name known to the ones whom the Father had given him, Jesus says, those who would believe. And furthermore, because Jesus has manifested the name of God to those who would believe and did believe, an adoption has taken place. I love this concept of adoption that the Bible, that the, that the Bible develops. These believers are no longer orphans in a slavery to to sin, but now have become God's very own children. Romans 8.15, for reference, says this, you have, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, adopted into the family with God as our Father. As God's adopted children, he has given us every privilege available to those who belong to this royal divine family, including that 
of a new identity in his name. The implications of this are just quite simply astounding. I don't know what kind of weight your family name carries. I don't know if it is something that brings you honor or if it's something that brings you shame. Furthermore, I don't even know if your family name carries with it the family identity that it should. And maybe for you, your last name is a source of pain because of a parent who abandoned you or disowned you or abused you and you would like nothing more than to get rid of that name. Maybe it's even a name you wish you didn't have because of a public scorn or humiliation. But in Christ... No matter how painful your earthly identity may be or how shameful your past is, God offers you a new identity with a new future and a new name. In fact, he offers us an eternal name as Isaiah 56 points out. Isaiah 56, 5. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters and I will give them an everlasting name which will never be cut off. Christian connects us to God. Secondly, Christian connects us to hope-filled suffering. And this probably sounds a bit strange. So let me start with 1 Peter to show you what I mean. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 16 says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but is to glorify God in this name. As a Christian, Peter says we ought not to be surprised by opposition, by suffering, by persecution, like we saw in Acts, for the name of Christ. Peter says don't be surprised by any of this. And at the same time, neither should we despair because of it. In fact, dear Christian, we are to rejoice in the face of suffering. That's crazy. Rejoice in the face of my pain? Are you serious? Why? And Peter points out two reasons. First, because it identifies us with Christ who also suffered. Are you suffering for righteousness' sake? It's good news so did Jesus. Secondly, because there is a reward that is coming at the final revelation of Christ when he returns. And therefore, Peter says, are you suffering for the name of Christian? Are you being mocked? Are you being made fun of because you claim the name of Christ? Rejoice! It means that the Spirit of God must truly dwell within you. But he makes the distinction, doesn't he? Make sure your suffering isn't because you're a murderer or an evildoer or a liar or a thief. Make sure your suffering is because of righteousness and godliness in Christ. Right? There's a distinction Peter makes. And not to confuse the two. It's just as Paul said to Timothy, said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not maybe, not might be, not probably, but will be. Do you desire to live godly in Christ? Then expect opposition. If you attempt to walk in the principles and the teachings of Christ, you are going to stick out like a sore thumb in this day and age. You attend church on Sunday? It's 
kind of weird. You read your Bible and actually believe it? That's odd. You give 10% of your paycheck to the church? That's crazy. (laughs) It doesn't take much godly living in Christ to be countercultural in America in the 21st century. And when you do, don't be surprised if you find yourself suffering for it at one level or another. But as Peter says, don't be discouraged, don't be ashamed. Instead, stand firm and rejoice in Christ and the name that he has given you, Christian. It's a good name. Thirdly, Christian, the name Christian, connects us to every spiritual blessing, and, and this is a sermon in and of itself, but let me just give you this. Ephesians 1.3 One of my favorite verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's a great verse. I mean, that's loaded, right? Through Christ, God has blessed us with every single spiritual blessing available to mankind. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, some of these spiritual blessings are explained in detail, and they are numerous. Um, So let me just give you 10 of them real quick, okay? In Christ, Christians are, one, chosen to be holy and blameless. Without Christ, that ain't happening, right? In Christ, Christians are chosen to be holy and blameless. In Christ, Christians are predestined for adoption. In Christ, Christians are redeemed by his blood. In Christ, Christians are forgiven of our trespasses. In Christ, Christians are lavished with grace and all wisdom and insight. In Christ, Christians are made known the mystery of his will according to his good purposes. In Christ, Christians are united in God's plan, whether in heaven or on earth. In Christ, Christians are appointed to an eternal inheritance. In Christ, Christians are predestined to hope, to the praise of his glory. In Christ, Christians are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, looking to a better day. These are just a few of the spiritual blessings Paul mentions. The point is that they are are all given to us through Christ and are reserved only for God's children. This is a privilege. This is an honor. This is a distinction. The non-Christian will never know these spiritual blessings. And I don't say that with conceit or pride or arrogance. I say that with brokenness consider it in Christ we have been redeemed our trespasses and sins have been forgiven the non-christian will never experience the freedom of the forgiveness of God that's tragedy beyond words when Christ has made himself so abundantly available In Christ, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit who has been given as a witness and a down payment of the eternal heavenly promise to come. But the non-Christian will never know the hope that comes through that promise. Can you remember a time when you didn't have any hope? When you were apart from God? In Christ, we have been chosen to stand before God eternally blameless. The non-Christian will never know what it is like to be in the presence of God without complete shame. But as born-again disciples of Christ, and I hope you feel the weight of that, I hope you feel the privilege and the honor of being a Christian. I want you to feel that this morning. And as born-again disciples of Christ, carrying the name of Christian, we have been given every spiritual blessing, Paul says. 
what an incredible, incredible privilege. So those are my three for us to chew on. And after sharing those three and how they're tied, hopefully, hopefully I've done a good job of trying to tie that in with the name of Christian this morning. But with all of that, I wouldn't be doing my job well as a pastor if I didn't express and explain the path that leads to the name of Christian. So as I conclude this morning, let me share with you the straight and narrow path that leads to life. As we turn our hearts this morning, this season, towards Christmas, towards the gift of God in the birth of Jesus Christ, maybe you're here today and you could certainly use a new identity, maybe even a new name. Maybe your earthly identity is associated with, with failure, with disappointment, or with shame, or with sin, or whatever it may be. Or, or maybe your personal name is connected with anger, right? Oh, I know so-and-so. They're, they're an angry person. I know them, right, when their name is mentioned. Or, or maybe, maybe your earthly name is associated with, with adultery. Oh, I know. I, I remember that name. So-and-so had an affair. Or maybe your personal name is associated with, with lies. Oh, so-and-so can't be trusted because they tell lies all the time if so then you need to know this morning that Jesus Christ came into the world so that as many as who would receive him he would give them the right the privilege to become children of God with a new identity a new name the name of Christian one who associates with Christ. I get that from John chapter 1. Let me read it to you. John 1, 10 through 13. Referring to Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Maybe you're in here this morning, and you need a new identity. It begins right here. If you will believe in the name of Christ, if you will believe everything this book says about him, confessing he is Lord, repenting of your sin, God says he will save you and he will give you the right to become his child. For the rest of you who have already taken the name of Christ, I encourage you this morning, rejoice. Rejoice, Christian. Rejoice in the Lord. We have victory. Though the world may mock you, may persecute you, as your pastor, I encourage you, wear the name with honor. There is no shame in this name. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you have revealed yourself through your Son, through the birth of Christ, through his ministry, through his, through his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself and your love to us, as well as the opportunity for adoption into your family. Regardless of our past, regardless of our sins, God, you make all things new through Christ. And so, Father, today I pray if there's anybody in here who needs that hope, if they need a new life, a new future, a new identity, God, I pray today you would have mercy on them and raise them up as your child through faith. God, and for the rest of us who already claim the name of Christ, Lord, we can't thank you enough. We can't rejoice enough. But God, I ask that you keep us strong. I ask that you keep this church strong, that you keep us unified in the name of Christ. God, that you would, 
that you would prevent us from being distracted by the darkness of the world that says that Christian is a bad name. Oh God, may we not be ashamed to be associated with you and your son. So Lord, we ask for strength in this day and age. Father, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory for everything that's been said and done this morning. I pray your abundant blessings on everyone this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.